Thanks a lot. Yeah. Good evening. It is 5.30 p.m. on Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023. And this regular meeting of the Sandpoint City Council is now called to order in Council Chambers at City Hall, 1123 West Lake Street in Sandpoint, Idaho. For the record, I'm Mayor Shelby Ronsett presiding. Also present are Councilors Kate McAllister, Deb Rule, Joel Espiro, Andy Grote, Jason Wilker, and Justin Dick. If everyone will please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Are there any announcements from council? Mr. Mayor, to report on Earth Day, we had a very fun and exciting and sunshiny day cleaning up uh, the beach. We had a great attendance to include some of us here as well as some of our other uh, commissioners. Uh, got to work with some really, uh, really kind, generous people that, uh, I don't know, I just, it, Days like that remind me how much I love this town and its people. And remember that, you know, the weather, the lake, the mountain, our play sets, they're amazing. So I want to thank you, everybody, for being out there and showing up. And I think we have some other council members that were there. Thank you guys. Yeah, I'd just add uh, kudos to Maeve. She did a great job, was out there working hard. And um, then we had some other lovely individuals who are here that rallied and Justin got involved with getting us water out there and sending some of his workers over because it turned out really warm and hot. So that was kind of nice how we could just pull all that together. Um, so it's a lovely morning. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I have a couple of announcements, uh, a couple of upcoming events uh, city related that I'm super excited to be a part of. Uh, this Friday is the Leadership Sandpoint Cinco de Mayo fundraiser party on Main Street in front of Justin's new restaurant, 113 Main. Did I get those numbers right, Justin? Thank you. Um, this year's Cinco de Mayo party is a fundraiser for UCAN, the unique center for athletes of all needs, which provides uh, services for children with different abilities from around the region, physical therapy and exercise related um, at that at the renovated Traders Lumber Supply Building just a couple blocks from here. So come on out 4 to 8 p.m. to 113 Main. That'll The block will be closed. Uh, we'll have solar stoves out there if the weather's not great. Some tents will be up, food vendors, and lots of uh, really awesome raffle and silent auction items. And I'd like to give a huge um, kudos to Teresa Lindholm and Kate Neese, the two uh, committee leaders, committee chairs who have really just pulled off this event. Um, super successful fundraising campaign already has taken place, and we're hoping to uh, raise quite a bit more money Friday evening, 4 to 8 p.m. The other um, event that I'm super excited to be a part of is the Sandpoint Bike Rodeo, which is next Friday at Traverse Park from 3 to 6 p.m. This is an annual event uh, co-sponsored by the City of Sandpoint, by the Safe Routes to Schools program, and by Pondre Peddlers. We're going to be doing free bike tune-ups for, for kids. We're going to have some skills uh, features set up there in the location of the future uh, Sandpoint Bike Skills Park. And the uh, fire department will be there doing safety training for, for kids who we want to encourage uh, to ride their bikes around Sandpoint. There will also be free helmets for kids who don't have them. And I believe we're going to have one bike uh, to give away that day as well. So that's 3 to 6 p.m. after school, a uh, week from Friday at Travis Park. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Any others? Council? All right. Staff, announcements. Yes, Mr. Mayor, a couple of announcements tonight, and I'm going to hand it over to Maeve. One is upcoming Arbor Day, and you've got a uh, proclamation on that tonight as well. Um, and then second on an upcoming workshop that will be held here at City Hall and then over at Travers Park on inclusive play. So Maeve. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Council. Um, so yes, the Arbor Day event is coming up, and this year's a special one. We prompted it to June 3rd so that we could partner with um, the Kinnickinnick Native Plant Society, um, as well as the Historical Museum. Um, it's a day of multiple events at the Lakeview Park, and that will be June 3rd. Um, but our event portion of it is to celebrate um, our annual Arbor Day festivity. And every year we plant a tree. This year, our tree is sponsored by Krista. And um, we will be having 
uh, experts from the forestry world there. We will be having all the same people that were there last year from um, the different arts and crafts community. Um, we're going to have a low maintenance landscape session that's going to be put on by local landscape architects from Aster um, Landscape Architecture Office and um, just a number of incredible sponsors. Um, and the whole community should come out. So the time is 10 to 2 p.m., but the plant sale that's going on there with starting at 9 a.m. So if you wanna get your plants, maybe come early and then come check out what we're giving away at our tree booths. And in your packets um, tonight is the flyer for that event. And I'm telling you about it now, so you save the date. But most importantly is this really fun map that was just put in your packet and it includes the Arbor Day Sandpoint passport. And if you come to Arbor Day and go to all of our stations, you'll get stickers. And then you fill this out and you can enter to win a very large, full, not full grown, but a larger tree, um, as well as you can get other prizes that will be given away. So um, we encourage everybody to go and learn about the trees. And then we have a proclamation that goes with that as well. Um, and then the second big announcement is we have so much great positive um, attention coming for the Traverse Park renovations. And one of those um, special projects there is the inclusive playground that you know I'm really passionate about. Um, and we have an offer that just came in from a company called Play Creation. They represent um, playgrounds, uh, manufacturers, a variety of them. And they're not affiliated with the project at all, but they heard about our project and um, they have offered to bring a national presenter who I personally have worked with in Alaska and I can't say enough about her. Her name is Jill Moore and Jill is a, an inclusive playground specialist. She's also a Paralympian and she's still in her 20s. So she's fresh and vibrant and has so much enthusiasm for play. She makes me look like I'm a grandma, but let me tell you this, this young woman, Jill Moore is someone that you want to, you want to see. And um, she's going to be here on June 6th or May 16th um, from 11 to 1 PM. We're going to have a lunch and learn presentation right here in uh, chambers. And um, the company, the playground company, Play Creation has offered to buy everyone that's in attendance uh, lunch. So we're gonna throw a pizza party. Um, we can only have around a hundred people in this room. So we're gonna have to cap it off, but um, there'll be flyers around and we're gonna uh, put out our press release today. that will be in the newspaper as well as on our website and our Facebook by tomorrow. So all that information will be in there, but the event is again, Tuesday, May 16th, it's gonna, it starts at 11 a.m. here. So we'll have a presentation for an hour that Jill is gonna talk about and what inclusive playgrounds are all about. And then we're gonna go over Traverse Park and we're gonna um, do a firsthand sort of a workshop session slash tour of the existing playground. And you're gonna get an opportunity to experience um, what it's like to be in a wheelchair, what it's like to have visual impairment, hearing impairments, and various other disabilities that we're going to try to replicate. And um, it's going to be an opportunity to learn. This isn't a, an, an opportunity to critique the project. We're not talking about the project so much. This is really an opportunity to learn about what inclusive playgrounds could, could be, what we have in our, our existing conditions, and what it's like to experience and, and literally walk or wheel in the wheels of someone else. Um, so I encourage you all to join. I know the middle of the day is a kind of odd time, but this is a unique opportunity and I just, I welcome all of you to come. Now I will say, if you're gonna come in person and you wanna come to City Hall, please RSVP. Um, we have an address up there. It's recreation at sandpointidaho.gov. Um, we ask that you, you RSVP by um, 5 p.m. on May 13th, so the night before. And the reason is we want to be able to get you lunch. So um, please make sure that you email us. And there is a virtual link as well for folks that want to attend. We will not be recording this, but we will be offering a virtual Zoom link for the presentation portion, not necessarily for the tour. But if you want to see Jill's presentation during your lunch break, feel free to Zoom in and watch the webinar. Um, and the Traverse Park meeting. Yeah. <clears throat> One more big announcement. So we are we don't have our flyers yet, but the following day on Wednesday, May 16th um, at Traverse Park from 2.30 to 5 p.m. We're gonna be presenting, drum roll, 
the final concept for the Traverse Park Phase One. So um, I'm I'm trembling as I say it because I don't I don't believe it yet either. But I think it's coming. We we do believe we're there. Um, we've been flushing out the design. We've been flushing out the budget all the way down to the nuts and bolts now, um, and we're ready to show the community. And um, we're going to offer an opportunity to meet the designers. We're going to have image boards of what the project's going to look like. We'll also be spray painting out the area of construction so neighbors can get an idea of what that impacts will be like. Um, we'll have the skate park concept finalized at that point, and that will be integrated. Um, and the skate park is just so you know that it will be a phased plan. Full build out, but we'll be showing our um, renderings of what this looks like. Um, full build out, but also what we can afford in this phase one. Um, and we'll be talking about the kickoff and the schedule to the project. And we are aiming to break ground in June. So this is the opportunity to come and ask questions. Um, and then following the, um, the workshop, or not really workshop, but it's an informational session at the, the park. Then we're going to come inside and we'll be at city council that night and um, we're going to start our presentation out next week on the 17th with um, an inclusive play, an inclusive uh, perspective conversation from some families in the community who are going to share what it's like to live here and experience our, our community and the challenges and also the, the positives. Um, and then we're going to roll into the designs and they'll be able to have the 3D models up so you can really get a grasp for what it's going to look like. So um, I encourage you all to be here for that. It's going to be obviously all of you will be here, but this meeting as well. It's going to be a really special day. Week of the fourth, right? Groundbreaking. That's what we're in for. A rumor has it, week of the fourth. Yes. Uh, July 4th? Yes, that's accurate. In fact, that's confirmed as of 10 minutes ago. Um, July 4th, we, we are aiming to have right around there that, um, uh, sorry, July 4th, we were aiming to have a groundbreaking. Yes, yes, a ceremony with that. And I'm a little flustered because I've literally been crunching numbers and looking at nuts and bolts and I'm moving up the system. I apologize, I'm a little bit out of it. <laughs> Thank you, Maeve, appreciate that. Is that it for announcements from staff? Okay. Thank you. I do have a uh, couple of proclamations to read today. Whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. Whereas the holiday called Arbor Day was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska. Whereas Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world. Whereas trees can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, lower our heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce oxygen, and provide habitat for wildlife. Whereas trees are a renewable resource, giving up paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and countless other wood products. Whereas trees in our city increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of business areas, and beautify our community. And whereas trees, wherever they are planted, are a source of joy and spiritual renewal. Now, therefore, I, Shelby Ronstad, Mayor of Sandpoint, do hereby proclaim June 3rd, 2023, as Arbor Day in the city of Sandpoint and urge all citizens to celebrate Arbor Day and support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands. And further, I urge all citizens to plant and care for trees to gladden the heart and promote the well being of this and future generations. Whereas in 1962, President Kennedy proclaimed May 15th as National Peace Officers Day and the calendar week in which May 15th falls as National Police Week. Established by a joint resolution of Congress in 1962, National Police Week pays special recognition to those law enforcement officers who've lost their lives in the line of duty for the safety and protection of others. And whereas public safety officers of the Sandpoint Police Department stand watch over our citizens, selflessly risking their lives to protect individuals, families, neighborhoods, and property against crimes, and whereas Friday, May 15, 2023, is observed nationally as Peace Officers Memorial Day in honor of those law enforcement officers who, through their courageous deeds, 
have made the ultimate sacrifice in service to their community or have become disabled in their performance of duty. And whereas the Sandpoint Police Department, past and present, who by their faithful and loyal devotion to their responsibilities have rendered dedicated service to the community. Now, therefore, I, Shelby Ronstadt, Mayor of the City of Sandpoint, on behalf of the citizens of Sandpoint, do hereby proclaim May 14th to May 20th as National Police Week within the City of Sandpoint and hereby publicly salute the service of law enforcement officers in our community and in communities across the nation. Throughout the City of Sandpoint, we urge and encourage all citizens to take time to appreciate our public safety officers and honor all peace officers who have made the ultimate sacrifice in the line of duty. Proclaimed this third day of May, 2023, in the city of Sandpoint, Bonner County, Idaho. Chief, would you care to come forth and say a few words? <laughs> Thank you, Mayor and, and Council. Um, I'll just be really brief. I think about this over 60 years ago, John F. Kennedy uh, knew the importance of dedicating that week to those who had fallen in the line of duty. Um, I have a family member we read every year from Idaho who lost his life in the line of duty. So that time frame for us is is special. It's personal. It's it's a day not only for us to to sit back and reflect on those who have sacrificed, but also a time to, to reflect on those families that were left behind, um, more so for, for them to be able to help support them. That's one of the things that uh, we forget about during those weeks is you talk about the, the honor that takes place and not only recognizing those that have sacrificed, but the, the widows and or the kids that were left behind. So it's a, it's a special time. I appreciate us doing it a couple of weeks early because it gives time for our community to to stop, ponder, and maybe plan for a little bit that's coming up. Uh, May 16th, uh, we're going to be with at the Bonner County Sheriff's Department at 5 o'clock. We're going to do the, the reading of the names. And we'll have a short, probably hour-long presentation out there for, for us, remembering those who have fallen. So those of you that are free and they can and stop by, it's outside. It's usually by the memorial at the Sheriff's Department. And we'll be there to kind of take some time and just reflect back. One of the things I'm often ask about is, you know, our officers. And I was thinking today a little bit about that. Um, and, and I keep thinking that, you know, I, I look at myself, we're just ordinary people, right? We're not special in any way, but we're, we're called upon to do a, to do something a little different. And there's a quote that talks a little bit about it. And so there are ordinary people who face extraordinary circumstances and act with courage, honor, and self-sacrifice. I think if I could sum up our police department, that's how I would sum it up. So thank you for recognizing us. And we hope to see everybody out there. Thank and you. Chief, could you re repeat that date and time at the Sheriff's Department? May 16th at 5 p.m. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. And in that spirit, I want to share a letter that was uh, sent to all of us up here at the dais from Janine Shepard, who is with a group called Pray 7B. And she often comes in here to... Uh, grant us a prayer at the beginning of uh, many council meetings. And uh, she's not here today, but I, I know she would really very much appreciate me reading this. So I bring you greetings on behalf of the members of Pray 7B. For the last 15 years, we've facilitated a gathering in Sandpoint's Farm and Park for our county to come together and humbly participate in a time of prayer in conjunction with churches and communities all across the country. This time together has no political purpose or agenda other than to recognize and call upon God's grace, mercy, and favor for our cities, county, state, and nation. One of our stated purposes is to pray for our elected officials. Through the years, numerous city and county officials have joined us and even participated in the program. We want to invite you to join us for this official day of prayer gathering in Farman Park on Thursday, May 4th at 1130 a.m. The music will begin, and from noon until 1 p.m., we will be led in prayer by pastors from different churches in the area. This year, we will continue to, we will continue our Adopt a Cop program, where we will ask residents to adopt a cop and pray for them regularly. We want to show our extreme gratitude to our law enforcement for the work they do to keep us safe every day. There will be an opportunity to sign up to pray for them at that, at the event. 
We hope that you'll be able, be able to join us on May 4th for National Day of Prayer. We want you to be assured that we are praying for you, not just on this official day, but all year long. May God grant you wisdom to accomplish the tasks you've been elected to fulfill as you serve the people of Bonner County. Sincerely, Lydia Razor, Janine Shepard, and Charlene Wright. <clears throat> Okay, next we will proceed with the public forum portion of the meeting, which allows the public to address the council and myself regarding items listed on the consent calendar or on any topic not listed on the agenda this evening. If anyone here in chambers wishes to speak now during the public forum or during any other portion of the meeting, you must complete a sign-up form available at the front table by the door and hand it to uh, the city staff, to anyone at the table there in the back of the room. If you're on Zoom and wish to speak during public forum, please raise your hand on Zoom at this time. To accommodate those who wish to speak on general items during the public forum, as well as those who wish to speak on specific business items on our agenda, a total of 20 minutes will be dedicated to the public forum now at the beginning of the meeting. If you'd like to speak and did not have the opportunity to do so, we will provide that opportunity by reopening the public forum at the end of our regular agenda. I asked for your attention, please, as I recite the rules and procedure for public comment during public forum, as well as for other opportunities for public comment during the meeting. Council may not hear or take testimony during public forum on any planning and zoning matter that is before the city or is known to be a likely application. Such toast testimony is allowed only during properly noticed public hearings. Issues regarding the performance of city employees constitute matters that must be discussed only in executive session and are not appropriate during the public por portion of the meeting. Matters that have been previously heard and decided by the council may be determined to be inappropriate for public forum. Citizens may use this time to request that items be placed on a future agenda for further discussion. <clears throat> Those in attendance are not to disrupt this meeting or the business at hand that is being taken up by the council. Disruptive behavior includes clapping, disruptive noise, and comments or exclamations from the audience. Comments shall not be personally derogatory, nor shall they be personally directed at any individual, organization, or business. Public comment opportunities during meetings are for comments only. Do not direct any questions to myself or council or to staff, and do not approach the dais. Also, please do not approach the clerk or other staff up here at the front tables as this disrupts the meeting. You may inquire of staff at the back table in the back of the room, um, and they can provide us assistance if needed. Each speaker will be allowed three minutes. When it's your turn to speak, please state your name clearly and whether or not you reside in the city of Sandpoint. Madam Clerk, has anyone signed up to speak during the public forum? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Give me one moment. Tracy Schmidt. Hi, my name is Tracy Schmidt. Um, I am not a city resident, but I'm a county resident. And um, I'd just like to show my full support of the new playground at Travers Park. As a pediatric therapist in this community for the last 23 years, I've witnessed firsthand the difficulties that parents with children with special needs have at finding recreational activities for their children. Um, I've also witnessed the challenges that parents and grandparents with disabilities have at participating alongside of their children instead of just watching them from afar. I was on the committee to um, choose the current playground at Travers Park. And while it's so much better than the metal structure on top of a hill that it used to be, um, even with the grant that we got, it's just not accessible fully. Um, the ramp is too steep. The slides are too steep if you have trunk weakness. There's no transfer stations. The footing on the um, surface is not compatible to wheeled mobility. Um, and a lot of the ground level activities have been broken over the years. It's getting old. Um, the new playground is going to be such a gift to 
the families and children in our community, not only for the disabled community, but also for the able-bodied communities, because everybody can play together. Um, I know at few or previous um, council meetings, they said that the part, the playground was going to disappear and it's not, they're just going to move it and they're going to make it so much better. The surface will be a uniform safety surface. So it will be completely um, accessible to wheeled mobility. Um, it's going to be inclusive to not only physical disabilities, but also visual impairments, auditory impairments, sensory impairments. Um, and it allow all the kids and parents and grandparents to play together, which is what we as a community need. So thank you for um, the opportunity for this, making this happen. Thank you for those comments, Ms. Schmidt. Madam Clerk. Rebecca Holland. Good evening, Council. Rebecca Holland for the record. Um, on that point about the playground, um, yeah, I know there's a lot of things that could be added, and that's what we've been advocating for, in making it more inclusive and more things added, but it's a great value as it is. Um, one of the points I wanted to, to bring up, I'm skipping along, um, is how things are so different anymore. Uh, used to be council could meet with department heads in public works in planning or park or parks and rec recs and ask questions or share ideas. This is how it used to be, but no more. Council gets a packet of information from the city administrator to approve and approve you do, even when you feel it needs more work. Case in point, the Sand Creek ordinance that you passed in March of 2022. It was said staff wanted this ordinance with urgency, but even with nine people showing, um, showing up in person and many others writing in opposition, out came the rubber stamps. Following passage, Councilwoman Deb said she'd like to see staff return with better language on access for the public um, at our waterways, and Mayor Shelby agreed. In fact, all of you agreed and gave staff six months to bring it back to us. Remember that? Now it's 14 months later and staff has this new design competition, says this new design competition will work it all out. Right, they got what they wanted with this ordinance loose for the developers and that's that for the community. Regarding Tavers Park, I have continued to gather signatures on my petition, which now has over 250 and I won't be stopping even after you remove the play set and cut the trees down right near Arbor Day. Yes, such respect. Very few parents know about this terrible plan. There's no, there's been no city survey for moms and dads. By the way, the temporary place set plan isn't getting any grave re, rave reviews because its placement, as I understand, is closer to the parking lot from, and the rave reviews are not coming from parents who chase their three-year-olds. So you can keep hoping the city taxpayers will be okay forking out $500,000 next year toward a full million dollar play set. Kind of crazy, this wasn't even in your parks and rec master plan just two years ago. But somehow into the woods for our little kids to play plastic logs over artificial glass grass with a splash pad bonus is now the big priority. And you better hope this doesn't go the same way as the skate park. I would think it gets old to cover for a staff that doesn't admit their mistakes. Nearly everyone involved sees through this, sorry kids, you'll have to wait, but keep on working and save some more money. While the staff caters to re retirees. I'm sorry, but this is on you, council. It's really- It's all in your time is up. Never too late to do the right thing. Thank you. I'm third. That is all for public forum, Mr. Mayor. Is there anyone online who would like to comment? Uh, no hands raised, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. We'll now proceed with the consent calendar. For the record, the total amount of bills is $607,008.44 for regular payables. Does the council have any items they would like to remove from the consent calendar? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion the consent calendar be approved. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Councilor Sparrow? Yes. Councilor Dick? Yes. Councilor Rule? Yes. 
Councilor Grote? Yes. Councilor McAllister? Yes. Councilor Walker? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, the first item under old business is an update on the adopted multimodal transportation master, master plan. Um, this comes, as you many of you will recall, we had uh, long ago, a couple months ago, scheduled to have on this um, on this day, May 3rd, an amendment to the multimodal master plan that included uh, significant changes to the east-west long-term connection. After um, a lot of comments and a lot of back and forth um, with the public, um, we received a lot of public input, and it seemed clear that um, well, there was uh, a lot of support for the city uh, to move forward with the short-term east-west connection changes that are proposed in the multimodal plan. The community as a whole did not seem ready uh, to, um, to move forward with a long-term concept. So those need um, further vetting and uh, maybe a little more time for the community to uh, digest those. And so I have um, directed staff to pull that uh, motion from the off the table and to kill that motion um, and to uh, wait for ITD to uh, come forward when they when ITD determines that um, the traffic thresholds reach a point that warrants um, a change, a major change to the east-west connection through the city, um, they will certainly let us know. And that would be uh, an appropriate time for the city to take up that issue again. And um, at that time, you know, reconvene a community-wide effort to uh, redesign and hopefully with uh, ITD support at that time, um, a new concept for the east-west connection. Um, and, and who knows when that could come? That could be many years down the road. Um, so that kind of takes us to where we're at um, right now, but I will ask Amanda to come and sort of break down and unpack for us um, where, we, where we're at right now and what we learned through this last couple of months and um, where we stand in, in uh, overall with the East-West Connection. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening, Council. I promise you the update is less than four hours this evening. <laughs> um, so to recap the Mayor's statement, uh, staff has been directed to focus on implementation of the short-term concept only, and the amendment is no longer being considered. The amendment was specific to the East-West Connection, which is referenced as Figure 23 in Appendix A of the Adopted Multimodification Plan. Uh, this PowerPoint presentation and general update is going to highlight these five sections. So a little bit of background information, some timeline of recent events, uh, the public engagement leading up to the multimodal uh, plan adoption, as well as a brief summary of recent public input an understanding of the overall process of how we go from a concept plan to a project that's not specific to the East-West connection. It's just true for all of our projects that we move forward. And then what's next? So by way of background, this is a slide you've previously seen. Uh, why were we even having a conversation about the long-term East-West connection to begin with? This concept was included in the multimodal plan in an effort to address and plan for future growth over the next 20 years as well as to address these eight key uh, considerations that we heard from the public during the planning effort. Majority of them are related to safety concerns, functionality at the Boyer intersection, and cut through traffic. The initial request to amend figure 23 was intended to achieve those three bullets, as was presented on March 15th at our presentation. The first being to reflect connectivity to South Boyer Avenue as a result of the acquisition of the property where Dubs is currently located, as well as remove references to any number of lanes on US 2, and to add additional notations regarding the importance of pedestrians and bicycle connectivity so that the point at which it was progressed to a preliminary design that that was really clear to everyone that that was super important to our community. This is the amended long-term plan that has, is not being brought forward for a decision this evening. Uh, that means that the current figure 23 that's in the multimodal plan remains the adopted plan. Um, so this figure that was proposed to be amended, uh, again, removes the lanes, provides that connection to South Boyer, and then in the upper right-hand uh, corner notes the importance uh, of pedestrians and bicycles as is further described in the overall multimodal planning document. Mm -hmm. 
we'll get into a little bit more detail on the process, as I mentioned, but overall the intent with amending figure 23 and progressing that design process now versus later was to help provide the community with certainty going from a concept to an actual design that gets more specific to those design details. And again, it was intended to resolve the citizens' concerns regarding cut through traffic on local streets, as well as safety and pedestrian, or safety for pedestrians and bicycles. Here's a, a timeline of the recent events, as you're all aware. The multimodal plan was adopted in May of 2021. That enabled us to consider and request that city council consider purchasing the property where Dubs is currently located because we did have uh, actually as a short-term uh, capital, as part of our short-term capital project list in the multimodal plan in the next one to five years, it indicated that we would be acquiring property associated with the long-term concept as well as progressing that design. So the request to purchase the property was in alignment with the master plan that we had adopted. Council ultimately made the decision on February 1st to proceed with that. Uh, Council, as you'll recall, you also noted on February 1st that we would table a decision to amend the plan showing the results of the purchase of the Dubs property. And on February 15th, you requested Cal, uh, excuse me, you requested that city staff host a workshop. On May 15th, staff provided a presentation intended to provide additional education to the public regarding the previously adopted multimodal plan and to address what appeared to be some confusion. As you all recall, the reader hosted a town hall that was really well attended, as well as an online survey. That town hall was on March 20th. And then last week, the mayor uh, directed staff to cancel any consideration of the uh, amendment to figure 23. And last week on April 27th, we hosted an open house regarding the multimodal plan as well as the comprehensive plan. And then we're here today. I am not gonna go over this in detail. You've seen this slide before and it is in the multimodal plan. It's just highlighting that up, leading up to the adoption of the multimodal plan, there was a number of opportunities for engagement and presentations to council as well as a variety of uh, individuals that participated in the planning process. Uh, despite COVID, we did have a lot of engagement. Um, this list is not all inclusive. And it, we also engaged with school kids, the senior center and many more opportunities. Specific to the East-West connection, you've seen this slide as well before. The, these are all of the opportunities that the public was provided an opportunity to engage on the East-West plan that is in the multimodal plan. We had a variety of publications in uh, the Bonner Daily Bee, as well as the Reader. And I joke about the four plus hour presentation on March 15th. Uh, staff actually is well aware that that is way too extensive of a presentation. Um, in general, it was intended uh, not by way of an excuse, but just explanation. It was intended to really cover all of the questions that we kept receiving from the public from February to March. Um, but just to highlight, it was actually a three-part series, if you'll recall, when we went to adopt the multimodal plan, um, trying to explain what is a very complicated document with a lot of engagement efforts. So what we did in four hours, we did in a three-part series to council before it was decided that that thing would be adopted. So summary of recent public input, you all received in your packet for this evening, all of the written comments and emails that were submitted to multimodal at sandpointidaho.gov leading up to this presentation. Um, so that was in your packet. Uh, you also received a um, portion of city council uh, at, attended the Reader's Town Hall and you received the survey results for that. You also, I know, are uh, well aware of this. I'm preaching to the choir. You have had a lot of letters and emails come to you and you've had many, many conversations with the public over the course of several months now. And I do want to highlight, this was on the back of the reader, um, as many of you have probably seen, and we did include this at our uh, workshop on April 27th, seeking feedback on it. It's really beautiful, and I think that fundamentally the reason it's included in this presentation is just to highlight that the community is very, very engaged in this conversation and is investing a lot of time, effort, and quite frankly, money in um, trying to continue this discussion. 
So here are our staff's key takeaways of the recent public input. I apologize in advance for reading to you, but I think they're important. Public, the public is highly interested and engaged in transportation. This is something we've known for a long time. When we have a survey about transportation, there's a lot of participation um, and ask thoughtful questions and every opportunity for engagement. It is truly impressive that people come prepared, they ask intelligent questions and you can tell they put a lot of thought into it. Uh, the reference to the public includes a lot of um, non-city residents. That's not a positive or a negative. It's just a note that we have a widely engaged public audience um, as it relates to transportation. Uh, through the engagement efforts, we've also recognized that there remains a lot of misinformation as well as disinformation and overall confusion. Uh, the most common misunderstandings remain the, related to the number of lanes on Highway 2. Um, the presence of an existing highway bisecting the city, the future concept at Bridge and First, as well as the overall status of the multimodal plan. There's some people that believe that it's, it's no longer an adopted plan, um, and there's still a lot of confusion around what's being amended or what's not being amended. Um, there are mixed perspectives regarding every concept in the multimodal plan. Those that are in favor, you can find someone that's opposed, as you all have heard directly. So we, we see it from every perspective in that regard. Um, the community has come up with a number of alternative solutions, napkin sketches um, to the beautiful image that was on the back of the reader recently. There are many, many ideas out there of how to amend some of these concepts. Uh, there is an overall lack of understanding and quite frankly experience as for how we go from a master plan to a construction project and that is not unique to transportation. Um, the public is also, in general, um, has a lack of understanding for when we have formal engagement opportunities um, and how best they uh, can comment, whether that be a workshop or a work session, for example. Other takeaways is that a portion of the community rejects that traffic volumes are gonna increase and or that any solution, in quotes, is needed. Uh, some desire for things to remain as is for as long as possible. We also noted that the portion of the, there's a portion of the community that asserts that planning efforts should have stopped during the height of COVID and that the multimodal plan fails to represent the public's concerns and or respect past decisions. That said, as the mayor mentioned, there is a widespread support for figure 22, the short-term solution, which primarily and simply moves the signal from church and fifth to pine and fifth. And then last, but most certainly not least, uh, staff, um, felt strongly that there is a clear value for all modes of transportation in this community and that decisions that relate to transportation have a direct impact on community character, vitality, as well as livability. Um, I would say that last statement is really the overarching um, conclusion of a lot of the feedback that was most recently heard, as well as what we've been hearing for a number of years and is represented in our comprehensive plan. I've shown this slide before, it's really just representing that we have a lot of plans. That's part of maybe some of the confusion. <laughs> we have a strategic plan, comp plan, master plans, capital improvement plan, then we get to the budget and then we get to projects. And so uh, various projects are at various points along this entire triangle. That said, in every planning effort, whether it be a master plan or not, um, on the left-hand side of every one of those boxes, it shows you where the public has an opportunity to engage and we provide opportunities for that. So uh, working from your left to the right, from initially looking at our past plans all the way to culminating into a new plan. This site has a lot of content on it, but I think it's important. Uh, we hear a lot that people are confused about the process. We want clarity on the process. So on the left is a uh, chart trying to represent that any typical project um, would follow this process. Uh, in order for staff to be engaging in a project, it needs to typically be in a master plan. Otherwise, why are we working on it? So we develop a master plan and you'll notice through this entire list, there's um, highlighted in green opportunities for public engagement. So master plan, we say uh, in the design effort, a master plan is zero to 10%, meaning it could be a paragraph and not have a picture at all, <clears throat> just an idea that's out there. And then that progresses into a feasibility study. 
So as we work our way down the list, the level of details in the design get more and more and more specific. So we start at a really high level of an idea all the way down to the specifications and type of concrete that a contractor is going to need to build a project. So the next step from a master plan is a feasibility study. Can, can we assess how much a project is going to cost and what are we going to need to do to implement it? So that's what a feasibility study is really, in simple terms, trying to look at. And we have to figure out how we're going to pay for it. Then we get to move forward with that preliminary design phase. The 30 to 60% design phase, basically that means if you think of a project in 100% level of detail, at the preliminary design phase, we have approximately 30 to 60% of those details determined. Um, and then we move from preliminary design to the construction documents. So that's very specific down to uh, even what size valve, for example, we might have on a main. Then the construction contract is obviously um, where we're awarding based upon a certain price. So I did note on the bottom right there that every single action, as you all know, at city council provides an opportunity for the public to provide comment as well as additional opportunities for information. So if you look at a typical project throughout the life of that project, there are numerous opportunities for public input. And just because we've done a master plan doesn't mean that the conversation has ended. Quite the opposite. It means it's just begun. So that's there's 12. 12 opportunities in, in that slide. And that's that's with a relatively simple project. It is, great point. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and to that end, if, if one of those 12 says public engagement, depending upon the complexity of the project, there could be multiple opportunities within that one line. So, you know, a master plan, there's one line that says public engagement, but we may have done 20 to 30 different opportunities for engagement. Um, if you look at a project like Division, uh, where we awarded, um, or not awarded, where we authorized for bids on a sidewalk improvement along division in front of the high school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're at the construction document phase and the public engagement associated with preliminary um, design included one open house. We could have a project like Travers where I respectfully have lost count how many opportunities for engagement we've had. So that one line, you mentioned 12, but 12 could exponentially become hundreds, depending upon the complexity of the project. So on the right, I just noted in relation to the east-west connection where we were at. Uh, we're not there anymore, and that is absolutely okay and in staff's opinion, appropriate. However, just for clarity, uh, the next steps would have been the feasibility study. And the next steps then from feasibility would have been to advance details to better provide certainty for what the project would have looked like, which is what the public is asking for is more detail. So that is on pause. And uh, after preliminary design, that's when we would consider um, you know, when to implement it. And when you implement a project, particularly related to transportation is looking at that cost benefit analysis. So we were very uh, far from that point. Um, and then the final design, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, adds more detail that would be specific to a contractor. So what's next? Uh, what does the future look like? We'll focus as directed on figure 22, which is the um, moving the signal from church and fifth down to pine and fifth. There are no other signals represented here. Um, and there are no uh, changes to the bridge and first intersection other than our downtown revitalization project, um, which is yet to be designed. Specific to the timing for the signal relocation, what is the purpose of that project? It's really to provide two-way travel on Pine Street between 5th and 4th. Uh, I do want to note that um, that has been actually the city's goal for a really long time. When the improvements on Fifth Avenue were implemented back in 2013 and 2015 and continued to 2017 with the two-way reversion of downtown streets, um, the, the city had always requested that the signal remain at Pine and Fifth. It was that ITD determined that the data didn't support it. However, through this multimodal planning effort, we were able to repair that relationship and uh, influence with our data that it does in fact work. So we're really proud of that and look forward to implementing that project. The funding source 
for the signal is through city impact fees. The tentative timing, we are currently uh, requesting uh, design consultants to respond uh, for the design of the signal and very much hoping that maybe we could reuse some of the materials that are at church and simply relocate it. It will have to be current design standards, so that's yet to be determined. In June, I anticipate you'll be receiving a request to award a contract for design and then also approve an ITD agreement. What I mean by an ITD agreement is when we're designing a signal on the state's highway, we have to have terms about what is the design criteria as well as are they going to review and approve it? The answer is yes, but we're paying for it and we're leading it because it's a city requested project. The state would be just fine keeping the signal at church. Then in the summer and fall of 23, we'll complete the design, move on to public engagement, hopefully in the winter, this coming winter, and then moving forward from there, ask council to consider approving um, us to issue a request for bids, bid the project, award the project, procure materials, and potentially have the signal relocated by the fall of 2024 would be the ideal goal. Mr. Quick question, Amanda. Um, are there any other modifications to, to traffic flow or turn what's allowed in terms of uh, turning on to and off of Highway 2 that are going to occur in conjunction with the movement of the stoplight? Um, I understood there to be some like right in, right out changes that might improve level of service through Highway 2 and further uh, postpone the ITD's, you know, insistence on moving a potential couplet project forward. Are we going to make modifications to Euclid to 6th to additionally improve traffic flow through that corridor? We do not have a schedule outlined for that. Staff's focus at this time is on the signal design. Um, the mayor has directed staff to pursue um, implementation of the short-term solution, which does include the Euclid right in, right out. Oh, it does? It, yeah, okay. if I go back to mm -hmm. um, right this particular I see. image, um, it does provide some restrictions there. It also provides restrictions on superior. So basically a do not enter sign um, that would prevent some of that cut through traffic in the interim. Um, but none of those other items are currently um, being implemented by, or staff is currently not implementing them. It's not to say that they can't be implemented and that would be consistent with the mayor's direction. We just don't have it scheduled at this time. We're focusing on the signal. Okay. And I presume that the stop sign on Pine Street uh, eastbound would go away with the when the new when the signal is moved. That's right, Mr. Mayor. Okay. That would be part of the design process. And if we go back to this slide, uh, when it relates to the signal, um, we are in the preliminary design. So once we have a consultant on board and get some initial concepts about lane configurations and stop sign removals and all of that, you will see that before you and you'll be able to review, obviously, the preliminary design and understand the details about turn lanes and stop signs and all of that. Thanks. So, Mr. Mayor, just to be clear, we are, are although our short term plan does include modifications to Superior to Euclid to Sixth. Our time frame moving forward does not include those. We're only doing the stoplight movement. Is that is that what I heard Amanda say? Yeah, it's simply not on the work schedule at this point. Okay, but, but it, it is. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. But it is the intention to continue with those short-term solutions. Okay. We're just starting with you know first things first. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. May. Yeah. Just had a quick question. So when the light goes in um truck route type of stuff um my understanding when the byway went in is that the trucks were supposed to bypass all of sandpoint street so they'd go up to pondere get off come back down fifth to go west on highway two and um then also do the same in the reverse depending on which direction they were coming from and they would not get off um and and drive through Sandpoint on Sandpoint streets because they're unless they're absolute local delivery. So as we do these changes, will we be re-signing and will we be enforcing? Uh, respectfully, uh, not uh, that is not currently um, the intent. 
So when council adopted the multimodal plan, you adopted a revised truck route that includes that we do allow trucks on Pine Street between Fifth Avenue and First Avenue and down Superior. So while I understand that was the intent 10 to 15 years ago, that intent evolved with additional data and input from a, the community during the multimodal planning efforts. So in order for us to sign and implement changes to the truck route on Pine, council would need to bring forward or staff would need to bring forward, I guess, and council would need to approve an amended truck route. Um, we have had many conversations about trucks on Pine. And my recommendation to city council is that after the signal is implemented, that we continue to monitor and we continue to collect data to better understand the volume of trucks that we're actually seeing in that corridor, and then strategize with ITD to potentially restrict trucks at Highway 95. So additional signage would need to be placed on Highway 95 to implement the solution you're referencing. What, we're, what we've found over the years since um, the reversion of wow. traffic, and I know Chief can speak to this as well, we, we've had this conversation at council multiple times, we find trucks are still using our downtown. So even when the intent was that the byway was going to resolve our truck traffic in downtown, and we had signs up and, and we did all of these things to achieve that goal, the fact is, is that trucks were still lost and they're still using our downtown today and they're still using First Avenue and Cedar so um, and Church. Um, so that would be my recommendation is that if the data is reflecting that we actually have a truck problem on Pine Street, um, once the signal's in, implemented and you're able to realize some of the effects of that change, then certainly the truck route could be amended. Thank you. So what's next? In addition to the short-term concept, we're also currently up, uh, working on an effort for an urban area transportation master plan. I've updated council on this at least two times. Um, this is a, a project that includes a multi-jurisdictional planning effort um, with a variety of jurisdictions in our region. And it really is focused on um, how our network system interfaces with the other jurisdictions. Uh, it's also based upon the census. The United States Census determines the urban boundary, um, not, not these jurisdictions. We've had multiple public engagement opportunities for the urban area transportation plan and we'll continue to do so. The next steps on the urban area transportation plan includes project prioritization and concept development. Um, for Sandpoint, the intent with the Urban Area Transportation Plan was to incorporate our multimodal plan by appendix into the Urban Area Transportation Plan. Uh, and what's currently underway is traffic, traffic network modeling by our consultant, AECOM. By, when I reference our, I mean the Urban Area's consultant. Um, that does not include data within Sandpoint. And then... I just noted on the right-hand side that from a next step perspective, once there is a draft plan available for the public's review, it'll certainly have additional public engagement and be published for feedback um, prior to any request for adoption. Just to help clarify, um, when it comes to the urban area transportation plan, that is a multi-jurisdictional plan. Each jurisdiction only obviously has the authority to adopt what's applicable to their jurisdiction. So um, each one of those jurisdictions will take the plan forward for their appropriate elements. And there is uh, the timing on that is to be determined. And last but most certainly not least <laughs> is our comprehensive plan review. We have um, been updating council and the planning commission on that. Our city planner, Amy Tweeten, is uh, Moving this forward, and I, uh, my sense is that our open house was very effective in bringing um, individuals forward. We had approximately 70 uh, plus individuals attend that open house for both transportation as well as the overarching comprehensive plan at the Sandpoint Library. Had some great feedback. As you've also heard, um, you currently can get on our website and follow a link where you can actually add comments to the draft document. We've had a lot of engagement in that effort, which is wonderful, and directly related to transportation. So there is a chapter on transportation in the comprehensive plan, so the public can certainly continue to engage on that and provide more feedback. Um, the next step with the comp plan is to come forward with a joint um, workshop or work session uh, with planning and zoning as well as city council. 
So that should be coming to you very soon. And then following a work session, then you'll have public hearings and ultimately a plan adoption. <laughs> With that, I would say thank you. Thank you, Amanda. That was excellent. Uh, does council have any further questions? Mr. Mayor, I don't have any questions. I wanna say thank you very much to you, the rest of the staff, as well as the previous elected, the previous community that brought this to us. There was a lot to unpack with this one. None, nothing up here is ever easy. I find it difficult to often untie some of these things to try to understand how we got here. It is my opinion that uh, this body, as well as this staff, worked very diligently through the pandemic. And th there are many of our community that were at home dealing with the important things at home. My takeaway from that is, thankfully, we were able to launch ourselves into the 21st century and engage our community better with more technology. I appreciate us as a community, as a body, taking a knee, taking a pause, letting all of us catch our breath. My hope, so I, I'll thank you. And my hope and my request is for more honesty from our community, less catastrophizing of pet projects that are very important to that individual. The truth will always rise to the surface. Conversations are always better than arguing, and it is always better to have one-on-one -on -one conversations rather than typing angry letters one way or the other. So I, so I really just wanted to say thank you to you, the staff, the intelligent community, as well as our past electeds that helped us get this far. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I just want to dovetail a little bit on what Andy said in the last two weeks have been awfully challenging. And I want to say thank you to all the community members uh, that I was able to interface with and sit down and spend some time with. Whether we agreed or we did not agree, it was great to actually sit down with somebody eye to eye in the same room and have these discussions do it rationally. And although we may not have come to a consensus, I, I believe your voice was heard. I felt um, felt like I have a greater understanding of some of our community members that I don't typically run into day to day. So I'd like to say thank you. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Appreciate it. All right. Um, are there any members of the public, Madam Clerk, that would like to comment on this matter? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Matt Deal. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. My name is Matt Deal. I'm a City of Sandpoint resident. I raised my kids in Sandpoint. I'm the Facilities Director for Lake Ponderay School District. I also oversee the Safe Routes to School Program. Um, I'm a for former Bike Ped Committee member. Um, that committee, if you don't know, was discontinued but still remains in City Code, I believe. Um, I, I did participate in a partial group of the multimodal master plan. I'm not sure where I was on that slide if I was up there, but my opinion on that is that it was a fairly limit, fairly limited process, actually. I think that's demonstrated by council's um, unawareness of something as big as a truck route being redirected through town. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was during the height of COVID, um, but I know there are a lot of good portions of that multimodal plan, but I would urge you to keep keep in mind that just concepts, just concepts, and and you know reconsider and really dig in deep with the public for any big projects they're going to change standpoint for the next century. So, um, since I have time. I, I do like the project on division. I think that's great safety for kids. I would suggest, and I, I mentioned to Ms. Wilson, um, the piece in front of the high school, the, the lane shift, snow storage, that could potentially happen all the way down division with just asphalt striping, changing the way we plow and enforcing the public to 
shovel their sidewalks. So we store most more snow on the east side, the public shovels their sidewalks, and for maybe just striping, you can have a safer corridor down division for kids on both sides of the street. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deal. Appreciate that. Pam Duquette. Hey, my name is Pam Duquette. I live in Sandpoint. Um, some comments I heard in Amanda's talk kind of rearranges what I was going to say, but basically, I know that you put the whole deal on hiatus for a while. But before you did that, some of us um, went around town and had a petition to get signatures to have you not vote right away on that. Um, we got 202 signatures. The um, petition said, we, the residents of Sandpoint and Bonner County, petitioned the city of Sandpoint to end the negotiations to enlarge Highway 2, Pine, and 5th Avenue into multiple lanes of fast-moving traffic. The difficulty for pedestrians and bicyclists to cross a highway from their neighborhoods is a huge safety concern. Idaho Transportation Department's own traffic projections do not warrant this type of projects for many years. And those are the what I gave her. Um, I learned a lot collecting some of those. Um, you mentioned the one-on-one -on -one discussions. I think that's really important. Um, I learned half of the people I talked to had no idea what was going on. I went into the neighborhoods where I live, where the traffic is, if, it, if Highway 2 is increased, Pine is already busy, and if Pine Street increases more, I'm on a little cut over Florence Street. People are using that cut over to avoid traffic lights. I don't believe drivers like traffic lights. They go to Florence to get to Boyer to take the stop sign instead of going to the traffic lights. So that's just something I wanted to share. Um, uh, that's so different from what I had written. Um, I learned that people want potholes fixed first. Um, they also don't feel like they're listened to when you do have offer surveys or input. They didn't want to sign because they didn't feel that it was worth their time, I guess. I know it's difficult to get public input and it's an art that requires tremendous effort in all kinds of venues and formats. I'm a KRFY volunteer and when we have an event, we have a list of bulletin boards. We go around town and put flyers up. Um, people didn't know about this and they didn't know about the April 27th even though it was in the reader, but that came out on that day. I'm thinking maybe notices in our utility bills. I learn about branch collection and leaf collection, um, something that everybody gets, that then if they don't see it and don't want to get involved, that's their issue, I guess. But um, I was concerned that people had no clue what was going on. And I did the neighborhoods where the impact of traffic is going to be the most and they did not know what was going on. I heard her say there was a lot of engagement and input, but in reality, there was a lot of people that were still unaware. So thanks. Thank you, Ms. Duquette, appreciate that. Molly O'Reilly. Mayor and Council, Molly O'Reilly, I live in the city. And first and foremost, and most of all, thank you. Thank you very much, and to staff as well, for putting the curve back in the long term. And this um, opens some opportunities. Let's avoid it. Let's have a major effort to keep our vehicular traffic low enough that we never need five lanes. ITD only is planning five lanes on Highway 2 from Sandpoint to Newport in Sandpoint. So the urban area transportation plan is really important. Last time they only modeled vehicular traffic. They didn't model walking. They didn't model the bus. They didn't model biking. You guys can insist on that. It's really important. And you may want to think about modifying 
your own transportation plan to set that as a goal. John Reuter was a city councilor and he's now a board member at Strong Towns. And he texted me tonight that he thought they might be able to get the Strong Towns executive director, Chuck Marone here to talk about how we as an area might do that. So that's something I'll have him put, maybe be in touch with, with the mayor. A couple of specific things, Michigan, Ella, please don't. We've been working on Michigan for kids since 2008, their sidewalk. Don't move the crossing to Ella until you have sidewalk on Ella. Um, if we're going to own our very own traffic signal, make sure that it's able to do a pedestrian lead signal. You don't have to set it up initially, but make sure that that kind of wiring is there. And think about seasonal and time of day changes. It's not, you don't want to turn left out of Euclid onto Pine in the middle of the day, the middle of the night, no problem. No problem, there's nobody there. I could just walk down Pine. So think about no left turn, blah, 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 to blah, blah, blah. Way better than something when you go at 10 at night and you go, now why am I not turning left? And seasonal. We have a problem at Church and First, seasonally. In the middle of winter, not so much of a problem. I came across that in Sweden where I said, what are those? Oh, in the summer, they go up to keep the traffic from doing X. And then before the snow comes, they get moved to the side of the road. We can do that. We have seasons, not much more than Sweden. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Good comments. Dan Logan. Mayor and Council, Ann Logan, City Resident. I'm basically here because Cody Van Dyke wrote a letter, and I think you all got it emailed to you, and I just want you to use that letter when you're making your decisions further on down the road when we get ready to do that. Cody was the former Sandpoint Public Works Director and City Engineer. So I think his comments hold a lot of weight in what he had to say in his letter to you guys. I had intended to read it all, but I can't do it in three minutes. As you can tell, I talk a little slow. So I just wanted to go over a couple things that he mentioned that I think you guys need to think about when you do get ready to do stuff. And that was, um, he, he mentioned that some of the three, three points that were in direct conflict with city resolutions of former councils and former citizen input that those councils used. One of them was installing signals instead of roundabouts. That was a resolution that the city had come up with. He didn't like the idea of signals, especially if the city, because right now the city doesn't own any signals, just the highway or the, the state, excuse me, and the cost of signals and keeping up the signals and, and all that compared to a roundabout. And the second thing was keeping trucks off a of highway are on Highway 2 to 95 and 95 back instead of on city streets. The resolution the council came up with before and the city citizens were inputted on was to keep the trucks on that route instead of down through Pine. And the third thing that he has in his letter that I hope you all do get a chance to look at was keeping things to three lanes, not five. And he talks about, and you can read it in the letter, but he talks about how with three lanes, that would be two lanes in other, each different direction and then a turn lane. And he felt that would be sufficient for that corridor um, down through towards Dover. So those were just some of the things I thought were high points in his letter to you guys. And I hope you guys get a chance to look at it when you get down the road finding stuff. See, I couldn't even do it in my stuff. The other thing is real quickly, I did do a survey downtown of of just on First Avenue of, of all the business owners, talking to them about the Bridge Street thing. And I'd say about 85% of them were, if they knew about it being phase two on your plan before, they did not like the idea of closing First Street there. 
They didn't like it at all. There was probably two people that considered it an okay thing. And one of them was on this side of, of the Bridge Street close off. Um, the rest were not interested in having that happen. They felt it would impact their businesses. And so if you get ready to do that, you might want to let some of the uh, business people give you input. Like I say, a lot of them didn't know it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Logan. Appreciate that. Harry Logan. Good evening. Mayor and Council, Kerry Logan, City of Sandpoint resident. I wasn't planning to speak tonight. Um, I had a whole little thing written, but since the conversation came up about, mm -hmm. about truck traffic on Pine, I scribbled some notes. So it's not as complete as my statement I have at home, which I was gonna present next meeting. Um, it is accurate that the previous request by the city to put the light at Pine, uh, it is accurate that we did. We requested that and, and ITD, as Amanda said, said, oh, no, no, it won't work when we knew it would. But it, uh, our request did not include through trucks on Pine Street. That was not a part of it at all. Um, and I hope you will take steps to make sure that trucks are prohibited. Little aside, the, the uh, master plan you adopted does not constitute ordinance. It isn't an ordinance. And in fact, there's no ordinance um, in city code right now to uh, establish any truck routes. It's just by uh, decision of uh, the city to go ahead and put a stop sign up. That gives Corey the ability to enfor enforce that. And you can discuss that with him in detail. Um, I don't think you have to study truck volumes to know that the city residents did not want, and councils did not want trucks downtown at all. Uh, so um, that was an issue of livability. And uh, so anyway, um, and there are, as, as my husband pointed out, resolutions to support that. Uh, I do thank you for putting the long-term solution and in general, the curve on the back burner. Um, We'll be all watching and, and eagerly <laughs> to see if ITD comes up with, with data that shows that uh, level D or worse has been, um, has, has happened. Um, but uh, let's see, anything other that I scribbled on here? Um, so anyway, just bottom line, I don't think you have to study truck volumes to know that trucks were not wanted downtown. It doesn't matter if there's one or 20. Trucks were not wanted downtown. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Logan. Appreciate those comments. Rebecca Holland. Okay, Rebecca Holland for the for the record, for the public record, here's the amount of money that's been spent according to the city's online checkbook listing multimodal transportation expenses. It started with IMS infrastructure management of Tempe, Arizona for 46,995 between October 19, 2019, August 2020. Then February, February 2020 to September 21, the big one is OTEC Engineering in Redmond, Washington, was paid $172,965. Follow up with fears, peers, or however it's said, joining in October 2020, November 2021 with another 51,000. So the 47G and 173G and a 51G is $271G, $100,000 that we've got into this master multimodal plan. So here's my firsthand experience with this expensive paper plan. I attended a workshop when there were two young planners that asked me a number of transportation questions. I was the only local in attendance, and I wondered later how much that cost the city to put down the, in this room. With COVID issues, I wore a mask, and so did these two young ladies. After answering the questions, I told them about the city's adopted bicycle routes, which they did not know anything about. We have a city loop with a main northwest and east-west connectors, and all were chosen to hook up with our schools, the library, our public parks, and our various multi-use ped bike trails. All the cycle routes are color-coded, making it easy for kids to follow the signage like this. First batch of signs were limited, but more were promised to produce better 
uh, site following. We we uh, spoke of the important connection. I spoke of the important connection on Oak Street between Fifth and First for passing through downtown core and reaching the city beach on our waterfront trails. There was a clear understanding of the um, genuine need for all of these routes to work safely alongside our streets moving the vehicles. Sometime later, I reviewed a draft plan and I'd also gone to some other little meetings, but was surprised at the minimum tension that there was to bike routes. There were basically recognized as being established with a nod toward possibly expanding. Missing was their importance toward being more uh, toward being a more vibrant community. To me, multimodal means giving as much attention to cycling as a mode of transportation, not just recreation, as it does driving. As a point to that concept, our bike ped committee um, years back made the effort to establish bike parking standards. We'd say, we don't ask cars to park 12 inches away. Why do we ask and slide through? Why do we ask cyclists? These standards were codified by the city, but they're not being implemented even on city projects. Case in point, the Traverse Park addition for 195 um, car this spaces. Your time is up. Zero parking for bikes. Thank you. Let me check online real quick, Mr. Mayor. There are no hands raised online, and that is all who have signed up to speak on this item in the room. All right. Moving on to the next agenda item. The final item under old business is an update on the city's art and loan silver box project. I'll now give the floor to Arts and Historic Preservation Officer Heather Upton. Mr. Mayor and Council, I am so excited to be up here um, sharing with you our Silver Box program. It's our public art on loan program, and many of you are familiar with this program, but I thought it'd be great to bring it to your attention and just refresh you all since we put a pause on it in 2020. Uh, due to all the things that were happening globally. Um, but the Arts, Culture, and Historic Preservation Commission is so excited to get this back up and running. And um, just as a reminder, I have a map up here. Uh, there are three locations with beautiful plinths that are um, ready for art. So we have them on Oak and Forth. Um, each artist will receive $1,000 as a provision to have their art out there. The city, uh, it will also be for sale too, which is a wonderful opportunity for exposure for artists. And if that commission is sold at the end of the um, period, which is a year long period for the artist, um, the city will receive a 10% commission. So just some highlights about the program um, and some I always like to reference my arts, culture, and historic preservation master plan. So this program addresses the creative community space needs. It supports the development of Sandpoint's for-profit creative sector. It offers professional opportunities for local artists, and it increases funding and capacity building for local artists as well. Um, and then in terms of recognition for the artists, um, they'll be included in the various media outlets, press releases, um, recognition on the city of Sandpoint's online channels, and then there will be a plaque and signage at the base of the artwork. Um, so as you can see, we have a couple of photos up here of some artists that are so excited to have their art in the public eye. and. Um, it's just been a really fun program, and I think it brings a lot of joy to the citizens. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. No questions. Thank you very much. I really wish the rest of our public were here and participated in this amazing presentation. It is unfortunate that Thank the you. dozen that were here chose not to uh, celebrate arts and history and culture here. It Thank makes you. us all really happy, right? I appreciate yes. this. I yeah. appreciate you a lot. <laughs> Thank you for your hard work, Heather. I appreciate that. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. There we go. All right, Madam Clerk, um, are there any members of the public that would like to comment on this matter? No, Mr. Mayor. Okay. The first item under new business is a discussion regarding business licensing requirements for event vendors and a review of City Code Title III, Chapter 11, Section 4, 
which addresses exemptions for city business licensing. And now you have the floor to city administrator, Jennifer Stapleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm gonna have Heather come up here too, because she, one wonderful thing we have learned since we have had our uh, art and uh, historic preservation officer on board is we learn a lot of historical tidbits regularly. So this morning we had our leadership meeting and Heather was filling us in on some details with downtown and I'm going to include her in this presentation a bit too. Um, we uh, I have been discussing some challenges internally related to our business license code and uh, specifically when you're required to get a business license and when you don't need to get a business license. And again, keeping in mind um, the uh, values and priorities that we've been given by council in our strategic plan of equity and fairness. Uh, and the challenges really arise around our special events. Currently in our uh, business license section of the code under um, 311.4, specifically under exemptions, Item number four, vendors participating in Farmer's Market, Ponderay Arts Council Arts and Crafts Fair, the Festival at Sandpoint, the County Fair, or any other sanctioned event on public property are not required to get a business license or pay appropriate fees. Um, there's some history specifically with the organizations that are identified in item four and um, I want to have Heather give you a little bit of a background on farmer's market and why it is not uncommon uh, that you will see in cities that farmer's markets are exempt from a business license or an event like Ponderay Arts Council Arts and Crafts Fair um, or the County Fair. And um, she'll give also a little bit of history on Festival of Sandpoint. We're going to talk a little bit about how that's changed over time. But our real challenge that I want to talk with you about tonight and get some feedback so we can come back with um, some revised code is related to the or any other sanctioned event on public property. But we're going to start with Heather giving some history and hopefully we cross out a few of these um, because we're, we would not be recommending any change in code for some of these special events. So Heather. Thank you, Jennifer. Anytime I have the opportunity to share a little history moment, I'm right there. Because <laughs> history brings us all together. It's the foundation of us all in our community. And um, so I, it was fun kind of learning a little bit more about those four organizations. And this is just a little high level overview, but I found out that farmer's market started in Egypt over uh, 5,000 years ago. So that's some good history right there. And a lot of uh, the city planning, especially on the East Coast uh, during the 1800s, they had that green space that they planned for where the farmers could bring all their goods to the market. And that was really vital um, to the community to be able to bring the local produce, baked goods, and the scent. it was essential to their daily life. Um, and then thinking about that, our first farmer's market was started in 1988 by Lois White. She was a master gardener, and my goodness, Lois started so many things. I think of the Connecticut Native Plant Society as well. So we're still blessed with all of um, the, no pun intended, early plantings that she did. <laughs> um, and it started at Farm and Park as well. And as we all know, it's been growing greatly and um, spilling out, you know, um, it's been greatly successful. The other one would be the county fair. So um, I always like to kind of go like high level national and then dive into our local community. I found out that the first recorded were in the 1700s over in Europe. And um, then thinking about our local community, and, and it was a big thing in the 19th century, we had like the it was brought to the East and the Midwest. And that was um, all about livestock shows, commodity competitions, agriculture education. Um, and it, it was a big deal for the community. And many people um, planned for months to take off work to be able to take their family there. Um, and it's a big social event. So ours started in 1908. 
And there were over 20 communities that participated. And um, when I was back in the museum, we always had so much fun looking at the fair photos that span back to that early period. Um, there were a range of prizes. Um, in fact, one was a term tuition for the Northwestern Polytech Business College um, for uh, an exhibit on fruit. So just had to share that fun fact. Um, and then thinking about our arts organizations, such as POAC, uh, that was established in 1978. And amongst making sure that they were bringing community concerts and arts exhibits to the community, they also established their arts and crafts fair. So that was all the way back in the 70s. And again, we have great photos of all those fabulous people in bell bottoms at the museum. Um, and then Festival of Sand Point, uh, they were established in 1983. And I thought this was really interesting. The festival's mission was to bring the sounds of classical symphony music to the community. So the focus really was um, on the symphony. And um, Fred uh, Kubiak, who unfortunately had the passing before, um, before being able to have that first festival. I thought this was an interesting thing. I always thought that the tent was really special and the fact that that trademark tent, it's very unique. It was purchased in 1984 to memorialize him. So when we look at that tent, we can think of him and, and how he established that. So um, as the years progressed, um, they offered um, different musical opportunities for advancing young professional musicians within um, composition, uh, jazz, and, and other um, conducting fields and so forth. So thank you for uh, giving me the privilege to do a little dive on that. Uh, it was super fun. So I'm going to keep you for one historical piece as we talked about this too. Um, really, in terms of who participates and what the event is, the true core of the event with Farmer's Market, with the Arts and Crafts Fair, POAX Arts and Crafts Fair and the County Fair, really nothing has, has changed it. Really, when we look historically, um, the events are the same. We have different people um, maybe are uh, participating in vendors, but the organizations are the same and the activity is the same. Uh, with festival, we've seen a, a bit of a change over history with the festival where um, and I'm sure all of the council members recall that um, the vendors at the festival with uh, food vendors and beverage vendors, um, historically, from the beginning of the festival up until recent years, it was about raising money for the community and for community nonprofits. And so I think that's probably um, one of the reasons that festival was was identified here specifically as an event is it, we, will, we all I think remember Panada being down there with their ice cream and that went back to benefit the Panada and it might be iCarts down there selling to benefit a nonprofit frequently that was water keepers but all of those vendors that participated in festival um, were about giving back to community nonprofits and um, that's where in terms of code whether um, we want to look at the change with festival and that it's now more um, more uh, food trucks kind of food vendors. It's not about necessarily the varying community organizations or when we get into other events on public property, uh, we've seen things change over time. And so we will have across tournaments, we will have uh, soccer tournaments, we will have baseball tournaments, our variety of activities that occur in our parks, and they're bringing in outside food vendors to um, bring in concessions and food for those events. And um, it has been challenging as we've been trying to implement and be fair across the different organizations, what was the intent and what's happening on public property. With our food trucks in particular, most of the council members will recall that there was a lot of community debate on our current code that we have relative to food trucks. And we are very restrictive to food trucks and it probably will be a topic we're picking up uh, after we finish the comp plan. But um, what really drove those restrictions was the concern about out of town businesses coming in and competing with local businesses that may have started as food truck vendors, but eventually became brick and mortar and have invested in our community. 
Uh, and so where we've got this provision relative to um, events on public property and exempting those from having to have business licenses, for many of our events, that means local food trucks, many of them who operate in city of Sandpoint and when not associated with an event on public property, but they're doing something else in city limits, we're requiring them to get a business license. So I will give you an example. Um, Smokesmith is a, is a good example. They're now becoming brick and mortar from food truck to brick and mortar at um, the old long shot location, um, if you haven't heard that. So that's an exciting announcement for uh, the community, but they've come in over the years and participated and had um, events next to McDuff's um, Beer Hall. And we have other events that uh, other food vendors that have been there too. And in that case, it's not public property. They're doing business in city limits. And we are requiring them to have a business license, like a business that is operating full time in city, in city limits. Now, when they were coming in, according to this code now, for example, it could be La Crosse, it could be the Ponderay Cup. They're bringing in outside food vendors and they're having them serve food as a part of their events, sell food. Um, and these are businesses coming in. They're not required to get a business license. So in this case, Smokesmith needs one. In this case, Smokesmith does not need one. In this case, Smokesmith got a business license and now they might be operating over at Ponder A Cup, but then we have another vendor that's come up from Coeur d'Alene that's operating there too. And because they're at the park, they don't have to get a business license. So um, our uh, recommendation to council and what we would like to do in coming back with code is to strike the provision that is, um, that is exempting events that are on public property because we've got uh, these differences were not equivalent. It makes it difficult for us in terms of enforcement. And we have businesses that are operating in town. It becomes clear and easier for our community resource officers or our building official if she's out doing inspections around safety that you have a business license that's gone through our process. And uh, you don't need to have a permanent business license if you're here for a temporary event. We have an option where you have a temporary business license, which is at a lesser cost. But again, we're we're doing inspections, we're doing reviews, we're doing those things that we would do for anybody else that is operating in city limits, but on private property as opposed to public property. And I don't know if council, in addition to that, has any feedback relative to the changes as festival uh, with festival. You've heard uh, from uh, Heather about the history of Farmers Market, the Arts Council, as well as the County Fair. And we had much discussion relative to that at our leadership team meeting a couple of weeks ago about why are these events exempted versus I'm going to call out a chamber event, summer mm -hmm. sampler, for example. Um, and uh, why is the summer sampler not in there, but yet it's exempted because it's on public property. And there are there is some unique history to farmers markets, uh, to county fairs, as well as our own um, arts and crafts fair. That it makes sense that they are that they are specifically identified. Festivals changed over time. Um, yes, overall, I'm certain festivals getting a portion of the profits for the vendors. It's different than what was occurring at the time that this code was adopted. But relative to other events on public property, um, we are looking at um, coming to council with a proposed code change that our business license rules apply, whether it's private property or whether it's public property across the city. So. We wanted to have some feedback from council tonight, and certainly that won't be the end of it because this would have to come back to you. Um, and there will be an opportunity for public comment tonight, as well as when it comes back to council. But in uh, from the notion of we don't just come with these things out of the blue and council didn't expect it, we wanted to bring it up for discussion tonight. And again, this is not a decision tonight. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, one quick question. Um, another event, significant standpoint event that just jumps to mind is lost in the 50s. And I believe for that event, there's very few vendors, right? There's like maybe half a dozen or a dozen vendors. And I assume what that they are also have been exempt is how they've been treated. 
Carolyn only has a couple of her own vendors that she has from year to year. So um, here, here we go with an example again. Um, so during Lost in the 50s, we've got that area that we designated for vendors that's specifically on Main Street. What's happened in that particular case is it's actually the city that designated the area. It's not part of Carolyn's official event. But we did this in coordination with Carolyn because vendors were setting up and taking advantage of her having a special event, and it was causing conflicts with um, the cars, the value of the cars. So people would set up, a, in the past it had happened where somebody set up a barbecue or right by a car and is selling those and were part of the event and caused damage to one of the cars in the event. So you'll recall, I think it was in 2017, uh, we said you cannot be set up under Carolyn's event. We identified a specific location on Maine that is our special event area, and the city handled first come first serve vendors. And in that case, because it is not a special event with us under a permit, we don't pull our own permit. They get business licenses. Mm -hmm. So that's some of the that's some of the inequity that's occurring across events and it creates confusion for the public it creates confusion for us in enforcing it no. mm. um i have a question yeah. so thinking of summer sampler any idea what the temporary license would cost uh madam counselor the current uh, temporary license is 22 dollars. it's valid for up to four days uh, the license uh, for temporary uh, business license is 40% of the general license, and that's currently $22. Okay, thank you. Because I do have three or four that participate from Ponderé and Hope, and so I, the chamber could probably eat that or figure out a way to do it so that it would be equitable across all the restaurants who participate. But I agree. I mean, if you're coming into Sandpoint to do business and, you know, there are other restaurants um, that have to have business licenses, so I think that's fair. Um, counselors, if we can organize this discussion for efficiency, if, if I can ask first, if we can comment on, um, how each of you feel with regards to eliminating the, or any other sanctioned event on public property. So where we would uh, grant the historical exemption for the four specific events that were discussed, if, if we can start with that discussion, and then if we can get to consensus there or something like consensus, then we can move on. And again, uh, Mr. Mayor, this is just feedback for staff, so it's not a decision. Um, yeah. It doesn't need to be consensus for, for or something like consensus. That. But feedback, <laughs> feedback, feedback for us from the individual gives us a sense whether we're we're missing sure. something. Um, and council again understands what's going to be coming back before council. Great. I, I just feel that we could kind of go down some rabbit holes here, and if we can organize the discussion a little bit, that'd be helpful. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Mayor, is yeah. is the proposal to leave the exemptions for those four specific events? Because I thought I heard you explain that due to the changing nature of the the festival at Sandpoint in particular, it's now for profit, not for charity. Mm -hmm. I thought I heard you saying that we would be requiring business licenses for. We have a debate yeah. on what will be coming back to council and whether uh, that stays in or out, given the nature and the difference from what it was historically. I think likely what you will see from the staff recommendation is would be striking the festival. Um, and and I would note with the festival, the festival itself as an organization has a business license. Um, and then striking the section related to any other sanctioned event on public property. So that's any other permitted event for clarification. Yeah, out of curiosity, in the last couple of years of the festival, do we know how many of the food vendors were local versus outside vendors? Are we, uh, uh, you know, proposing a solution to a problem that doesn't exist? Or do we have a lot of outside vendors coming in without licenses and operating at the festival? Lot. They don't have a lot of vendors at festival, but they have two or three vendors in recent years that have come from outside of the area. Okay. Anybody that they have that's local. Um, already they has have, a business license of course yeah whether and typically typically particularly when we get into food trucks that are local most of the food trucks that come in even if they may be up by the animal shelter in Ponderay, if they come in and they're at, next to the beer hall 
um, they're getting a business license because they might be coming in three or four times a year. So. Okay. My comment would just be, um, I would hate to see it be problematic for specifically things like um, the soccer cup, because it seems like the benefit of having those there. So if we do make changes, if we can definitely um, educate the event organizers to let people know well in advance and that I don't think that $22 is a you know, would take it off the table from somebody who's driving up from Coeur d'Alene, say, to do that event. But I do think it is important for the participants in those events, sometimes having historically been one, it's somewhat chaotic. And when it's right there and you've got multiple kids playing and you can't really leave, that um, I'd hate to see that go away because we make changes like this. So, Mr. Mayor, yeah, just to comment on that, we've had to deal with those events in the past. Mm -hmm. Um, so when, for example, when we had our local option tax vendor, whether they're in town or out of town, you're selling in city limits, you were required to collect and remit the local option tax. Mm -hmm. So for our um, Ponderay Cup and others, in those cases, they had to get us a list of vendors. They had to ensure their vendors got their sales tax permit and got all of their paperwork to the city. So uh, we have worked with the local events in the past, not specifically on the business license, but specifically related to the sales tax permits and had a good process that all of our event okay. organizers were aware and they were super cooperative with, with that whole process. And again, to that point, um, so now we have to have equal enforcement of the local option sales tax. So you have your sales tax permit our community resource officers go out and they better have that posted um, in their food truck if that's what they have or their booth so that they know that they got the appropriate permit are collecting and remitting the sales tax. So kind of the same similar concept. The other thing that I would note is what happens with business licenses is business license triggers, um, business license application triggers an inspection through our building official and that side of things. So it's not just about pay a fee for nothing. It's about who is doing business in the community and going out and actually doing an inspection and ensuring that the business that they have is safe for our community. And so that does happen with food trucks and vendors um, who are coming in with a hot dog cart, a food truck, a something like that, a tent in the community. But the trigger to that, again, is a business license. So right. when a business license isn't obtained, then business license triggers that use permit and that kind of review. It makes sense to me to have the business license and then the sales tax comes and all those other things. I just want to make sure our process is solid so that we don't create a problem we didn't realize we were creating. Part of what set this off too is number one, uh, as it's proliferation of food trucks, number one in our, in our parks. And it's an efficient way to have food service for um, the event participation participants there on site, balanced on the other side with our local businesses in town require a uh, really their lifeblood is those events too, to come in. And when we get populations coming in from out of town and the tourists that they're spending the money and that benefits our, our uh, local businesses as well. But we had another event, new event this summer that um, because of our events keep evolving. Uh, so we have another one with a market that they're going to be doing in the park. Um, and it is a for-profit uh, it is a for-profit host putting on that market, and then it's for-profit businesses. And again, we've got with this businesses coming in and no business licenses, and we have businesses in town. And a reminder to uh, the council about this, we don't get to pick and choose across events. Like we can't, that, that is not an option for us if you meet all of our safety um, requirements, our impacts, all of the things that we're doing through analysis, all the things that we're doing through a special event process. If you have an event and you are selling, bringing in a food truck, you are bringing in somebody selling 
soaps or handmade goods that maybe three stores in town have, we don't have an ability to say you can't have that kind of event, but you can have a different kind of event. We don't get to pick based on content. Mr. Mayor? Yeah. Um, Melissa, if you will, how much is a permanent business license or an annual business license for a brick and mortar? Councilor Dick, currently a uh, current uh, regular general business license is $55 per year. It's $55 initially, and there's a renewal of $27.50 per year currently. After that, thank you. Um, I, I think I completely agree on our historic events. I think they're fantastic at mobilizing communities around our community uh, and getting those together, <clears throat> selling goods that are grown on our land or made in uh, very close to our community. I think they're fantastic. I think a lot of the the heart of this, the way I see it, and especially if we're talking about food trucks, is this uh, is the money benefiting a nonprofit organization. So when you take something like the uh, Sandpoint, the uh, uh, what is Summer Sampler, take the Summer Sampler, right, and we're splitting profits, or fifty percent of our profits are going back to a five hundred one c three as well. And could you at least take some, uh, or at least recognize if these vendors are coming in to our town from another community or wherever they're coming from, uh, is it for profit or it, are they giving back to a specific nonprofit, uh, one that is designated with a 501c3? I think in terms of food truck, you could come up with a pretty easy solution on what type of money would be going back. You've got roughly 30 to 35% food costs another 30 to 35% worth of labor that would be going into it. They're serving it, their cost plus their labor, and they're donating anything above that, which would come in somewhere between 25 to 40%, depending on where they're, um, where you're coming in. And, and does that make sense? Is that if you've got a for-profit market, but you've got a vendor specifically donating their money or donating their sales or a portion of their sales, to a nonprofit organization that's been vetted by the city. Um, and you could reasonably take a look at revenues and what percentage was donated back that the city could waive the $22 temporary fee. I I understand that the you, suggestion, yeah. but I would tell you that will cost us more than $22 sure. to do. It would create more administration at the city in order to look at all. We have some of them genuinely that are doing sporting events, for example, and have eight, nine, 10 vendors. We have a cottage market coming in that hopes to have 40 vendors. So if we're, we're trying to break all of this down for all of these different events and these different vendors and what one might be doing versus what another might be doing, because I know we get those differences across the different organizations too. Um, then my recommendation would be we're better off to leave the code as is because it will cost us money and staff time. So if it's for a nonprofit event, um, if it's for a nonprofit event and nobody's paying those business licenses, we're not getting any thorough inspections from the city at all. No, because they, they're not coming through that process mm -hmm. for us. If somebody calls in and has a concern, um, or uh, about a public safety concern. I mean, obviously we're gonna respond to that, but otherwise, no, not if it is on, it's a sanctioned event on public property. I mean, we're going out as part of special event permits uh, and we do inspections on different things. Like for example, before festival, that's probably our most intensive inspection process. We're going out before festival and staff goes out and our building inspector, our police chief, our fire chief, our um, and our park staff are all going out and looking at our exit signs clearly labeled so the public knows, um, verifying the setup and safety of the tent. We have to look at smaller tents, so that happens with POAC as well. Um, lost in the 50s, fire chief is out there at 4.30 in the morning. Um, to make sure the cars are backed up. So no, um, no, we don't have any uh, fire hydrants that are blocked. So all of those kinds of things, we do those inspections. But what we don't do is go look at individual food vendors as a part of events. Gotcha. And a follow-up question on that, you said something about a marketplace that was going to be for profit as well. So theoretically, each of those businesses would pay their $22 in a temporary uh, business license. 
And then do you know what they would roughly pay the event organizer to be there? No, because we don't get into that with the event, but I can say in that very specific case, um, Melissa's our business license expert. She was out of the office. We met with the event organizer. And again, this is where the confusion comes in. Lost in the 50s, we're dealing with business licenses. We dealt with um, we dealt with sales tax permits. And so that event organizer was told when she came in that she would need all of the businesses under her would need to get business licenses. And so would she, she said, no problem. They were all willing to do that. They would get the business licenses. Melissa was out that day, then came back in and said, she called over and was with, with her business license. And Melissa let her know that she does not need to get business licenses. Their vendors do not need to get business licenses because of this provision of code. Okay. So that is the precise example that we got talking about code and the way this is written creates a lot of confusion for vendors because what capacity are they in? Um, and second off, then we don't have consistency with what we're communicating because it's not real clear. So Mr. Mayor, yeah. if I may, um, I, that raises a, a couple of questions for me and Melissa, maybe this would be a question for you. Are, are we creating a layer of bureaucracy that is going to pile work onto Melissa or whoever gets, you know, given this job in the future for, you know, the, the future. I mean, this is going to be in our code for a long time where every business, so 40 vendors want to show up. There's 40 business uh, permit applications that have to be processed now, 40 inspections that have to be arranged. Um, we're, we're creating red tape. And although those business owners, those vendors didn't really balk at the $22, I'm wondering if that comes along with, you know, a backlog of permits that need to be processed. And now organizers of these events are are scrambling and, and communicating and, you know, just panicking when it comes to getting all their vendors, uh, their licenses. And th that's one concern. Are we creating red tape for $22? Like, it sounds to me like the city is going to be incurring much more than $22 of cost with each of these permits. When it comes to the inspections, Christine going out to, to inspect trucks or tents, that's certainly costing us more than $22. Uh, secondly, I, I know because I've been involved in several event organize, organizing um, efforts this year, finding food trucks right now is already extremely hard. The, the, the market is tight. Um, their prices have gone up considerably. Many will just say no for, for an event that I've been helping my wife organize. It was like the, the fifth food vendor that we finally got to agree because of uh, some of the bureaucracy and red tape that's already in place with the location. It's not in city limits, but uh, I hesitate to impose more barriers to entry into a market that's already extremely competitive. Um, competition's good. We know that to, 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 to protect our local businesses sounds great, but if it's creating more work for the city, and making it harder for organizers of these uh, community events that are really great for the you know lifeblood of our our culture and our community. If it's going to make it harder to attract vendors or to get those permits processed on time, uh, what you know, I, I hesitate to erect barriers to events that we all love to be a part of. That are it's going to create more costs for for the city and uh, more bureaucracy and red tape for the organizers of these events. But one thing I would remind the council is that when we have come forward with a staff recommendation, it is a staff recommendation. Yeah. This isn't a one staff member's opinion and another staff member's opinion. There has been a full discussion with the staff and a recommendation about an appropriate change. So um, we did talk about the impact with this on, on business licenses and processing. And as I mentioned, we do deal with this and have dealt with it with um, sales tax uh, permits in the past. And the way that we deal with it with the event organizers is when you put in for your special event, we let you know that there are these provisions if you're having vendors, because you need to let us know. You get us a list of the vendors you're going to have at the event so we know who they are and can get a hold of them, let them know the criteria. And it is the event organizer also lets them know it's been a very organized process. Then we go out, it's one inspection of going through there, making sure everybody's got their appropriate licenses. In that case, it was sales tax permits because we're already out there inspecting the setup of an event. But what particularly triggers our building group is do we have somebody out there who's now using kitchen equipment somewhere um, and 
are they aware of that? So again, most of them, most of these, if you are bringing in an outside event, uh, food truck event, and you're bringing in one of the food trucks that's either permanently in Sandpoint or you're bringing one out of Ponderé, Kootenai, they have business licenses because many of them, we already see they're over set up with McDuff's under a CUP as an ancillary business. And in that case, they already got a business license. So they may be doing something else that required them to get a business license. So most of them have it. Uh, we did talk about summer sampler in particular, and that was the debate ahead of this is, well, how would this impact chamber? Would this be an issue? So um, we did discuss that as well. And feedback we received is, again, this was something reasonable to bring forward. So. Okay. Look forward to the staff recommendation. All right. We yeah, I, I guess one question that I would have, um, and you know, I think this is where uh, Councillor Dick was going. Um, you know, do we need to? You know, I, I think we definitely have agreement on the three events. You know, maybe. Well, remember, you're not. There's no decision at all. So there, this is just individual council member feedback. I know. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble, right, Andy? <laughs> well, we're just, yeah, but I, I think there's a little bit more to consider here. Um, it, it sounds like some counselors are agreeable to um, reconsidering the festival's uh, exemption here. Um, but I thought uh, Councilor Dick brought up an interesting question uh, around summer sampler is a great example, but do we maybe want to create clear criteria for what it is about these three events. So yes, they have historical significance, but maybe there is another event uh, or, or another event exists, or there's a future event that could exist that council may feel qualifies, it should qualify as an exemption. And so what, what are those characteristics that would qualify an event for exemption? And maybe that's something um, that the council wants to consider. Um, no, it's not something that has to, you know, that we have to, you know, figure out right now and, and for this next action. I know we're a little bit under the gun with um, with the um, applicant that has uh, already applied to to the city for a special event, and we're, we're kind of on a timeline there. Um, but, but I would just pose to council that maybe that is the direction we want to go in. Um, and I would invite any comments to that if, if any of you feel uh, that that's necessary. And if not, you're, I'm getting an interesting look from <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Rule there at the end of the dais. Um, was that confusing? Mayor, that we should come back with yeah. where we are headed in the direction and have council discussion when we actually present this for, for council action. That was my look. Need a little bit more something in front of me to read what I'm kind of opinioning on. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Madam Clerk, is there any mem member of the public that would like to comment on this matter? No, Mr. Mayor. All right. Hearing that, we I have will... one more question, Joe. Can you just tell me which three events again? Because I got lost okay. in what we talked about. Farmers Market. Farmers Market, Monterey Arts. Yes, I should put my glasses back on. Yeah, that's that right. Be there. Okay. There. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Mayor, before we leave this, reached out to festival, so we would do that before this comes to council. This is just a point Good of idea. discussion at this point. Okay. Heather, this is a request of you. As I'm thinking out loud and here and listening to you uh, talk about our history, I felt very grounded in what, what, what you were saying, and it reminded me, it brought me back to some of the reasons why we're here. So my request to you to think about as you're scheduling permits and time permits that you bring some tidbits to us, some tips, not necessarily tips on how to govern, but tips of how some of our four founders, some of the things that they were dealing with um, and remind us some of our historical relevance and importance of why we're here, what we're doing, and that history does often repeat itself and sometimes it's cloudy. And so, my request, look at your schedule. If it <laughs> lines up with council, 
maybe bring us a bit of a history lesson to help me and others be grounded with the importance of what we're doing here. I love that. He just opened the door. Is that like, oh, oh, oh. Is that like requiring Greg? It is yeah, very similar to Greg being great props. Great agendas coming up for the next few months. <laughs> so, so then therefore being grounded would be very beneficial and helpful. <laughs> I would love that. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Mayor, thank, thank you very much. Yep. The final item on the agenda this evening is consideration of an ordinance amending City Code Title I, Chapter 10 to address and clarify the lawful and appropriate use of the city's corporate seal and official logo and to provide for penalties for violation of this portion of the code. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council. I will be brief. Um, we have um, submitted to you a proposed revision to uh, Sandpoint City Code Section 1-10-2 to include um, a city logo uh, into the ordinance. Um, the city logo was created in 2014 for use in city documents, uh, the city's electronic advertising, and other uses related to city functions. We have a prominently displayed logo on council's dais. We use it on our website. We use it on our letterhead. Uh, it's become part and parcel of the identity of the city. Um, historically, and by statute, the city adopted a city seal in 1949, which is even older than me. So <laughs> it's been around a while. Um, in fact, Madam Clerk brought the official seal with her today so that if anybody wanted to look at you could. Um, what we're proposing to um, the council at this point in time is that we include with that identification of the city logo, both in the color format and also a black and white format, which is part of section um, D of the ordinance. And if you could scroll down to the second page. <clears throat> the proposed updates to the ordinance uh, will also memorialize one identification of the city logo in the ordinance to appoint the mayor and elected officials as custodians of the city logo, uh, declare the seal and the logo as property of the city to be used only as official on official documents and city and city purposes, and will prohibit all other uses thereof, and also provide for penalty for violation of the ordinance. Um, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, and those are the recommendations we bring to the council for consideration. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank quick, you, Mr. Doman. Appreciate that. Yeah. Quick one. Are we also going to trademark the logo? Is there a, a trademark protection we could seek as well? We are looking into that right now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But it's yeah. not part of the ordinance. Okay. Um, it says an F towards the end. Um, it's likeness or design or any design so closely resembling the same as um, is to me that seems pretty subjective. Um, I mean, like the colors, like a bridge, the sun. That that is part of the protection of the logo itself. Uh, the color scheme and the and the the, the designs, it, you know, for lack of a better term would be included in that. And what we're trying to do is make sure that we protect the logo from any uses other than for city purposes. Um, you could change one color, it's still gonna be the logo. Mm -hmm. uh, or you could change one contour on the background, it's still gonna be the city logo. It is, uh, to some degree, it is subjective, yeah. but uh, it's also something that can be discerned if you look at it from a standpoint of, is it trying to mimic the city logo or not? Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, yeah. um, I know I said this uh, when we brought this up before, but, um, you know, organizations pay tens of thousands of dollars for specific colors. T-Mobile is a specific color. ITRON was a specific color that you cannot use. Um, and even just looking at it, if somebody were to design something that made you go, hey, that looks like the city of Sandpoint's logo. So that's that's what we're doing. It's intellectual property. It's our, you know, it's private property rights. And so if somebody and if somebody uses the logo or the likeness of the logo, it could be perceived that it's coming from the city, that we sanction that or that we, you know, that they have our permission. And so I think that it is. And I think it's just normal language to say colors, design, likeness, um, in any of that. Yeah, and I, and I hear that. I guess my my question, really, I mean, it is still subjective, and the only way to make it not subjective would be litigation, right? It would be somebody, somebody higher yes. than, than us 
because we could say, hey, we don't like that, but the individual or individuals or business could say, well, see you in court. I mean, that's potentially yes, right? And yeah, so yeah, yeah, seems very subjective. Colors, it's like I don't know. Any other questions or comments, Council? Yeah, to Madam be clear, I'm for I'm I I get it, but I think we also need to be careful. Yeah. Uh, Madam Clerk, is there anyone from the public that would like to comment on this matter? No, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate it. I'll see you out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hearing none, um, I will now read the title of the ordinance as follows. An ordinance of the City of Sandpoint, a municipal corporation of the state of Idaho, amending Sandpoint City Code Title I, Chapter 10, Section 2, Corporate Seal, providing for repeal and severability, and providing for publication and an effective date. I'd entertain a motion that the ordinance pass its first reading by title only and the summary is approved. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? This will be a roll call vote. Councillor McAllister? Yes. Councillor Rule? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Grote? Yes. Councillor Sparrow? Yes. Councillor Dick? Yes. The ordinance has passed its first reading by title only and the summary is approved. I would entertain a motion that the rules requiring three separate or, uh, readings once in the ordinance's entirety be suspended and that the ordinance, ordinance passed its second and third reading under suspension of the rules. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Uh, this will be a roll call vote. Councillor Grote? Yes. Councillor Sparrow? Yes. Councillor McAllister? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Dick? Yes. Councillor Rule? Yes. The motion passed in this ordinance, number 1404, is considered read, passed, and adopted under suspension of the rules. And that concludes our agenda this evening. Thank you, everyone, for participating, and have a good evening.